But the one thing that people have learned, and you know, we've read this in the trade press and the popular press, is um, the generative part is sometimes wildly wrong. It says with great confidence <laughs> and well-structured sentences, incorrect stuff. Welcome to Conversations That Matter, a podcast from Unifor. Here, we explore the latest customer experience trends, sales insights, innovations in AI and automation, and more with well-known thought leaders and industry experts. Tune in and join the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Conversations That Matter. I'm your host, Randy Ksar, and we are live in Palo California, and I'm so excited to bring on Dan Miller from Opus Research in person. Dan and I have been uh, going back and forth. We've had podcasts together, yeah. uh, emails, tweets, LinkedIn <laughs> messages, uh, but we've never actually met in person. Right. You were my pandemic buddy. You were part of my pod. <laughs> I was part of your pod. I am honored to, to be part of your pod. And, uh, you know, I think one of the key things uh, is that what, what we try to do on this podcast is to build community to build relationships. So I think that's uh, what I want to make sure that we keep on doing yeah. uh, because it's uh, it's so important. Yeah. Oh, so well, it's great to meet face to face. And yeah. also thanks for inviting me down to the new headquarters. It's beautiful. And it's nice to see so much activity. It, it's it's very yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, it's bustling, as they yeah. say. Um, so you just moved from New York to San Francisco. Uh, I'm wearing a Yankees hat uh, for those that are listening in from uh, the audio side of the things, for those in the video. I will explain myself. I'll explain myself uh, why I'm not a Giants fan. I actually I am a Giants fan, but my youth, uh, uh, my uh, little league that I coach uh, is the Yankees, and that's just how it all ended up. So, still got a little hair there, and my <laughs> Yankees hat is on. So today, uh, Dan, um, you know we're gonna go through uh, some questions uh, that kind of focus on. Generative AI, but also conversational AI in the enterprise. There's a lot of buzz. You know, we kind of we'll answer some of those questions that everyone's been yeah. clamoring for. Um, but really, uh, you know, the first thing that I want to start off with that we do a lot in this podcast is what is the um, the one myth, <laughs> uh, the one challenge that you think that companies have in adopting conversational AI? Right. Um, you know, I want to start with that again. It could be a myth. It could be a challenge. What are you hearing in the world? So the, the challenge is just imprecise understanding of what we're talking about and, and the fact more than ever before, words matter. So that, um, you know, some, some people have credited me with coining the term conversational AI, and I'd like to um, say, okay, uh, <laughs> but what, what did I mean? I, yeah. I meant that there, when in enterprises, individuals talk about AI, they tend to, whether they like it or not, they're thinking about general AI and, and you know the, the robot overlords that are destined to replace people. And you know, going back six or seven years, we were saying, no, there, there's, there's a subset of AI, of okay. artificial intelligence broadly defined that have to do with supporting better conversations between people and other people, so your employees, yep. people and machines, so your self-service resources. And they, they tend to gravitate towards um, natural language processing, towards machine learning, because once you sort of understand um, the natural language, the words that people use mm -hmm. when trying to converse, um, that evolves. And then a, a certain amount of, of advanced analytics that's able to extract insights, um, detect patterns in these conversations, and therefore recognize not, un not necessarily in a human way, not, you know, uh, well, okay, and this gets to the heart of it. We all tend to anthropomorphize these computer resources. And, you know, there's discussion of, oh, if I'm going to, bring a bot in, do I treat it like a digital employee? And in some respects, you do want to do that because that's how your age, <laughs> that, that's how you can yeah. measure results. That's how you can sort of evaluate the value of this thing. But they're, they're not 
people. Yeah. <laughs> they're not understanding. They're, they're recognizing patterns and um, at best uh, uh, deriving insight, well, helping people derive insights to make themselves more productive, to uh, provide a, a better customer experience, that sort of stuff. So, yeah. um, so in terms of the myth, what is what is the one that, that these conversation AI technologies uh, want, need human intervention? Right. Uh, right. Wait. Okay. So let's say that that one of the myths are if if you just go straight to hey, what's the bottom line impact of bringing quote conversational AI or employing some sort of generative AI? Um, am I replacing people? Um, and, and therefore sort of reducing my payroll, which is very much in fashion right now. Yes, Lay, it is. Layoffs are the big thing here in the yeah. Valley. And, and there's some economic prudence or financial prudence to it. Of course. So you'd think that uh, you know, the analyst in me thinks that, you know, among the reasons for bringing a, a, a bot on board is to, you know, offset my payroll. Yeah. And, um, I I think that's misplaced. I, that's um, I mean my my saying for a long time had been, hey, these things are just tools, and right. um, they they make uh, customer you know they they speed customers along their path or journey from looking for something to buying something, yeah. or they help employees comply with you know either you know regulatory strictures or stick to the script sort of thing. Okay. Um, so they're more efficient, but we're not we're not here to replace people. We're here yeah. to make businesses more pleasing to their customers and and their employees yeah, that makes sense. alike. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were just talking. We just had lunch uh, together. For those that you want to know, kind of time of day <laughs> we're at. Uh, we have a little buffet lunch that comes every day over here, uh, and one of the things uh, we were talking about was um, just some of the cryptic uh, messages that happens on. Uh, self-service devices mm -hmm. these days. Uh, I, the, one of our one, one thing that comes to mind, uh, and one person that comes to mind is Leslie O'Flahaven, and how she talks about uh, uh, the writing in general and just kind of plain language writing. Yeah. And one of the things I was at CVS and I was checking out, and as I was checking out, it said when I put my card in, it said system processing. I'm like, what the heck is that? Yeah. You know, self-service solutions. Uh, as simple as the checkout self-service counter, <laughs> and although that's not conversational AI, it's like there's some lessons learned from our everyday devices that can be applied <laughs> towards you know these self-service solutions on the on the digital end. Um, and I think you went through uh, some similar ones too, right? Well, <laughs> we we can take it that way. The the um, I mean, one of the things about speaking precisely about th this topic, um, conversational AI generative AI, that, that what has attracted all this attention lately and why uh, en uh, enterprise decision makers are thinking about how do I want to incorporate AI into yeah. like my self-service or my employee uh, productivity sort of fabric is that this thing called ChatGPT came along. And it is this natural language front end to um, well, that, it, that uses prose that's generated by a computer. Right. And it, it's, it's very good. <laughs> it, the, and, and, you know, let I, you know, let I, let's, I'd be interested to have Leslie read some of it because it is grammatically correct. It, it yeah. follows a lot of the rules that she talks about. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, it's just wrong a lot, <laughs> and, and yeah. you know anybody. It's only as good as the data that's in there, right? No, that, no? but that's not the point. <laughs> it, it, uh, yes, the, the the data is from quote large language models, which means that in in many cases, at least for a long span of time with a finite ending, it has everything. So you can't say it's as good as the data that's in there. It, it's um, well, these things are built on something called. Uh, well, at least for OpenAI, GPT, where the G is generative, the P is pre-trained, meaning that right. they've already sort of gone through and categorized stuff. And then the T is transformer, which um, 
is, is literally a, a model, an, an AI model that takes context into account, not just the individual words being said. Right. So I think when you try to understand what's going on there, I always replace it with transformative because the, the old way yeah. that we would do search or use these machines is, you know, give it a keyword, find, you know, get some blue links out of it or, or whatever. Um, so and, let's let's uh, since we're on that on that topic, yeah. Um, you, you explained it already. Um, what do you think the potential use cases are in the enterprise? I think that's kind um, of the key, yeah. thing, right? Well, and yeah, just one thing. Like, there's been a lot of buzz about it. There's been a lot of people just kind of jumping on board and testing it out. Now there's the enterprise version. Um, again. It's great and all, but yeah. when it comes to the enterprise, I think that's what we kind of focus on. And so I want to get your take on just the technology, yeah. not not the company of an AI, yeah. but the technology and, right. and how it can uh, be yeah, applied. Let's just and, talk and, about and, and large enterprise. language models in general. Could be, you know, DeepMind, could be, you know, something, you know, Baidu is doing. Yeah. Um, um, and and Unifor was, was kind of ahead on this and not necessarily using, you know, a, a, G, a you know, large language model. But um, you were saying, hey, what's the potential use case? Yeah. So people have discovered that this summation, and, and this, this, um, this is the post-call uh, analysis of the conversation that an agent has had, um, that you can use artificial intelligence to recognize, to, to give a summary of all the topics that were brought in. Right. And, and this is just out of the box. This, this, <laughs> this, does not require training, and in fact, it's sort of like part of the family of training. Is that hey, you you deliver the transcript or the spoken word to the thing. It says here are the three topics that were brought up, and here are the commitments that were made. And you could train it to say you know you know make sure that they comply right. to you know with you know that they stuck with the script or you know made the offer or whatever, yeah. and. Um, they found that it's faster than the agents doing it themselves, and it's more accurate than if the agents had done it themselves. <laughs> and and that that is for real. The the other one um, actually is in the self service realm that you can um, you can take historic transcripts, uh, historic recordings, feed it to the thing, and and it will in very short order return. Um, with the categorization or the distribution of what the calls topics right. were and that sort of stuff. And that That's a is real. a real time saver. And, yeah. um, real but, business value there. But the point there is um, there's, there's no hesitation now to adopt these things. And, yeah. and that, uh, you know, whether it's ChatGPT or some other family of, of, a, of a large language model with a generative component, there's really nothing new here. And there's a number of firms that have been playing around with this for years. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, all that's happened now is um, 100 million people plus have expectations that they can do this themselves <laughs> and that they are going and kicking the tires and, and discovering something every day that sort of improves. You know, if they're a coder, it's it's making code. It may not be good code, <laughs> yeah. but, but you point. know, it's a starting point and, yeah. and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so let's get into some potential use cases. Uh, right. and, and one of the areas that I think is most interesting to me is in the banking uh, industry. Um, I wanted to get your take um, from a, a contact center uh, perspective. Yeah. Uh, let's focus on that kind of um, use case within the banking industry. Why would they want to implement uh, this type of technology? Yeah. Not necessarily generative AI, but maybe conversational AI. Yeah. And, and it, it's a particular category in, in financial services where um, your agents are trained professionals. They're they're, you know, they're financial advisors, and um, there's X percentage of the calls coming in are not going to challenge them in any way. <laughs> you know, there's there's you know, I, I lost my password or. Um, yeah. Um, something you know, like, you know, they want to find the so status of that. a wire transfer or something, and and those are the sorts of things that that with you know natural language understanding with a pre-built sort of language model, they're they're ripe for automation, and so you know part of the story of automation is to free up your 
both expensive and well-trained groups to not get bogged down in, in repetitive, low-value stuff. Yeah. But now the flip side is um, the, these well-trained folks um, have, you know, all, all, they have expectation that maybe they could put a prompt into some sort of chat GPT type thing and just um, see what the answer might be. You know, you know what, you know, in, you know, in this time of um, when interest rates are going up and bond rates are going down, you know, what would be an ideal investment and just see what the thing says. And, yeah. and, and actually this, this is, um, this is happening right. <laughs> and it's getting very interesting because it also points up to up, out the fact that these things aren't going to replace us. <laughs> the there, you know, there, there's two new types of jobs that are exemplified by this. One is you can have a subject matter expert with the new role of prompt engineer, right? Because there's ways to ask questions that you'll get a good answer. Right. But the one thing that people have learned, and you know, we've read this in the trade press and the popular press, is um, the generative part is sometimes wildly wrong. It says with great confidence <laughs> and well-structured sentences incorrect stuff. So you have your you know, trained professional able to look at it and say, that's not right. This this part is good, <laughs> you know. I'm I'm gonna you know my client should be interested in an annuity, and you know it, it's good at saying okay, here's 50 prospective annuities you could look at, <laughs> um, but it may have a, a section a little further down that that is just really you know off the wall, not the right thing, yeah. and you know that's something to monitor. Um, you were talking about. Um some of the different roles, uh, prompt engineer uh, as one of them. Um, in our previous podcast, we talked about conversational design, right? Uh, which is not necessarily a new skill, but it, it's, <laughs> it's fairly new within the past five years where, yeah. where uh, either you've come from the NLP side and data scientists, or maybe you even come from the UX side, and people are starting to design these conversational experiences, which I right. think is, is quite interesting uh, as a, a new skill set. Um, and as you're talking to new, numerous companies, um, do you see this th that skill set as an advantage uh, at companies over others? Because it, it you need to build it's still an experience. You know, right. let's just kind of separate the two. Yeah. Um, do you think that's a, a skill set that you've seen uh, uh, when you're talking to other companies? This conversational design uh, side of things. Oh, ab absolutely. And you know, every every. All of these roles have, you know, precursors, you know, so there, there were VUI design, you know, voice user interface designers, there were natural user interface designers, and, and the desire has been speaking <laughs> to, to, to your question, you know, about, you know, have I seen sort of crappy responses <laughs> from these, yeah. it is to enable um, customers to, to speak in their own words and get results that they want to have, that's been um, the objective forever. I was going to say holy grail, but holy grail is something you never had, you know, actually possess or obtain. Right, right. But th this is something that is now within our reach because, um, you know, the computer power is there to sort of hear us speak in our own words and map it to with some some percentage of certainty with the correct answer. And um, there's uh, well experience, there, there's cu customer experience experts that totally get it, that a, a couple things are going on is um, when you when you measure results, um, people like companies had a bad habit of just doing these sort of things as a one-off. And people yeah. would ask about the accuracy of a self-service technology in recognizing an intent and then answering. And then if somebody got an answer, they'd say, okay, you know, we're 95% we're accurate now, or we're more accurate at understanding than yeah. a person. Right, right. <laughs> and you'd say, okay, but 
Um, now we have conversational design that says hey, when somebody asks a question, you know, let's just say, hey, or not even ask a question. If they make the statement, I want to buy a car, there is intelligence there that says, um, oh, if they want to buy a car, they're going to have to answer these questions. So there's, quote, slots to fill about, you know, what is your price range? What color are you thinking about? What model make? Blah, blah, blah. But that only. But then there's the next thing is that oh, if they're buying a car, do they need financing for that car? Do they need insurance for that car? And as you design experience and realize that we have the capacity with conversational AI to make that a natural feeling. A natural flow. Yeah. Not right. So it used to be that you know you'd have to do step one, step two, step three, because basically you're filling out a form. <laughs> it just reminds me of back in the days when I used to learn basic programming back yeah. in, in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. On uh, the HP, what was it, like 85, I think my dad had at the okay. time. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you remember back in those days. It was a tape cartridge computer, mm -hmm. and, and that's how the responses would be, right? Right. You, you would, yeah. You would well, it, it, was, it was more like um, stuff we experienced these days these days on on tablets you know in in these self-service places yeah. where you know you have to answer questions in order yeah. or you can't stray you know off. filling out your tax form using um uh you know quicken books or whatever it is that that they they walk you through a form and you answer the questions one at a time whereas when we think you know, even if you're booking a flight, you, you know, you know where you are, where you want to go, what day you want to travel. It wants you to say it in, you know, what airline do you want? I mean, yeah. um, we're, we're, we're finding that a good use case is just to let people speak in a free form way and then use some sort of resource to make sense out of it. Yeah. And then, Fill out the form for you. It's, Sounds it's pretty simple. simple. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's go on to like kind of the organizational structure that you're seeing when people are actually building these um, these experiences for customers. How how are organizations, you know, structuring? Because like when I was talking with uh, Discover Financial yeah. a few weeks ago, we got the UX team over here working on kind of analyzing the the the, the real time data coming in and designing the experiences. You got the product engineer. You got the customer support. I mean, yeah. it's still very siloed. Do, do you are you seeing that as well, or is this uh, maybe a new trend coming soon where these uh, experiences are going to be kind of centralized within an organization? Um, I, I've been doing this too long to think that <laughs> what we call silo busters are are going to disappear. Yeah. But there's some silos that. Uh, it kind of have to disappear, and and I mean, what what we're seeing now is that uh, there there's sort of market segmentation happening uh, for solution providers who are bringing AI into you know the the customer care path or yeah. the employee productivity path, and um, there there's sort of the just you know, starting and feeling pressure to catch up because everybody's doing it, uh, sure. who don't have the experience that the experience companies have where, you know, they started tackling this um, years ago. And yes, they had to hire, you know, uh, lingua, you know, uh, computational linguists, they did uh, buoy design or, you know, uh, user interface designers, they they did have the IT folks that were, you know, making sure that stuff was getting delivered um, from the back office, you know, in, in the yeah. right way. So, and and those roles don't disappear. They're, they're still vital in making things work. But the silos that kind of have to disappear is that um, somebody in the mobile group wanted a bot <laughs> and and uh, to uh, you know rec you know to do the customer care stuff to recognize yeah. who the customer is associate um, you know understand what they're saying if they needed to stick with finance if they needed to open an account if they lost their card there were there were already language models for doing that and you know oddly enough if it was in the self-service realm 
you know, people that worked with the IBR had already built things for reporting a lost or stolen card. And then somebody would come up and say, oh, no, we're doing that for the mobile. And they don't use the same code. They had a whole different tool set and they built the mobile yeah. one. Somebody did it for no, the I definitely heard that website. story before. <laughs> what? <laughs> definitely never heard that before. Right. I've experienced that before. Right. So now the, the next step is, um, you know, going forward, companies feel the pressure to get rid of redundancies there. And they're looking for the path forward where there's one toolkit, there's one single view of the customer, there's one um, you know, source of the history and information of, yeah. about your um, products and services. And, and we do have the potential with this capacious natural language front end, that this, this you know, chat GPT type thing, um, to uh, to to sort of do it once and have it rendered correctly, uh, you know, according to what yeah. your customer is using. So that's closer than ever before. <laughs> that's good. Um, one of the things uh, that you've uh, done recently is a report on computational intelligence uh, that Unifor has recently featured, um, and I want to ask you a couple questions on that. Uh, without being too chest beating, uh, but one, it, <laughs> I, I just show, <laughs> yeah. I show off my guns. <laughs> so, well, first thing is, how do you go about analyzing those companies? Yeah. Uh, so that's question number one, and then, um, why is a platform approach the right way? So let's yeah. talk about how you kind of came up with the report and yeah. how what it is, uh, because there's probably some people that haven't heard about yeah. it. Yeah, no, uh, no, it, it's good. I'd love to yeah. hear more about it. Because, because Opus Research, uh, a, a ways back. Um, you know, we've been doing a report on intelligent uh, virtual assistants, our, our enterprise intelligent assistant in Teleview for like seven years now. I think we were one of the first firms to look at yeah. the, the companies that were providing the platforms, if you will, for creating bots. And it grieves yeah. me that <laughs> we called them enterprise intelligent assistants, but people heard bots. So, so it was part of answering the question of, oh, how do, who, who helps me build a bot? Uh, faster, um, uh, you know, faster time to market uh, and faster results and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, we evolved uh, to look at companies that were, and, and this is this report, the conversational intelligence. Um, our, our premise was that, okay, enterprise intelligent assistance, if it's going to map to bots, is going to be over here in the self-service side. Yeah. But what companies are really looking for is uh, someone to bring a solution that um, is, you know, works just as well for each of those channels that we talked about, mm -hmm. the, 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 the mobile self-service, the, um, you know, bots on your website, and, or, um, even the agent assist, which is becoming a very hot thing. Could, you know, could each agent have its virtual assistant, you know, giving it prompts and stuff like that. And our, our assumption was that um, though all of those resources needed to be informed by, consistently with insights that are derived from past conversations. And now with this overlay of, of not just past conversations, but even large language models and how that's going to be brought in. Right. So we were thinking, well, we should be looking at the firms, many of whom, uh, and, and Unifor has done this from its inception, um, are using you know, advanced, analytic, advanced conversational analytics to uh, extract insights that can either, that can inform a bot. They can also be access, accessed through what we call sort of the role-based administrative uh, dashboard. Yep. So that um, yes, some some somehow some way you you're using technology to treat this body of conversations between companies and their customers, companies employees with one another um, to just sort of recognize issues that are coming up and apply it to improving self-service, to employing, to improving employee performance, and, and then um, share these insights across departments. So that's what we were sort of looking at is who, yeah. who's bringing those mechanisms into gotcha. the enterprise fabric. So the second part of the question was, why is a platform choice <laughs> the 
the optimal way to go. Yeah, we'll, we'll and and, and platform being sort of an ambiguous word. True, but but, true. but the idea is um, to have probably a sing. It's not even a single. Yeah, you call it a platform because it's an amalgam of technologies that are purpose built, purpose driven, and and easy to sort of bring into these talk paths. Right. And that, um, you know, whether individual buyers, you know, the, the enterprises on the buy side want sort of the latest best of breed from a multiplicity of vendors, or they want a a single vendor with um, what they ordain the best of breed, um, they 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 want some coherency in how they administer it, how they add new features, how, when they add new features that it not make everything else break. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful, right? That that sort of stuff. So yeah. um, I mean, that was one of the things we found in in a survey that we had done about um, enterprise decision makers and how they were building bots these days. Is right now like eighty? Well, well over. I, well, we did this middle of last year, and this may have changed, but yeah. but at, at that time, like eighty percent were leaning on their solution providers to do a lot of the work of bringing a bot into life, <laughs> and um, so it's kind of force feeding uh, well, no, a solution, or, or well, it, it's 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 a form of outsourcing, you know, because you're yeah. asking, you know, how are, how are companies staffing up? And sort of the the largest of the large in in businesses that can build an ROI around improving self service would hire folks to to you yeah. know do this stuff, whereas um, you know medium to large firms that you know don't build bots for a living you know they, they yeah. have like a core business that they're yeah. doing yeah. they they would lean on their vendors to to, to come up with something yeah yeah well. Uh, so no, that's great. I mean, I understand the report. So uh, where, where can people go uh, to find out more about the report? So the report and and other stuff from Opus Research is on. Is, it's available on our website, yeah. which is opusresearch.net. Um, one of these days, we'll talk to some firm in Australia that is holding <laughs> opusresearch.com <laughs> ransom. Um, but we also we do own opusresearch.ai, but we're not using it right now. So right. so the place to go is opusresearch.net. Um, we we also you know sort of post. Um, insights and and thoughts on things that are happening in the world in this world of conversational commerce conversational um access technologies all that stuff everything all things conversational conversational ai awesome all right uh so great uh and uh you know well thank you for answering all these questions i mean this has been great to, to really understand your thoughts and, and viewpoints on conversational ai on generative ai mm -hmm. um i think uh there are probably a lot of questions out there um, and this is being recorded on demand, but we want to make sure that you guys can hit us up with questions as yeah. well as maybe Dan. Uh, and so as we uh, are streaming this uh, on LinkedIn Live, um, feel free to put in your questions uh, in the comments and we'll make sure to answer them. Or if you want to tweet us at uh, with the hashtag CTM podcast, that's CTM podcast. Uh, and then mention either at Unifor um, or even better uh, at Dan Miller uh, oh. <laughs> on, on Twitter, right? Oh no, uh, I'm sorry. I'm DNM five four. DNM five four. I apologize. Right. Yeah, DNM five four. I remember that. Yeah. Um, so we will. I was an early Twitter user, and <laughs> it was literally an SMS system. Everything. Yeah, was, I remember that. Yeah, and they said, "Oh, keep keep your handle short." So I, <laughs> I couldn't spell out everything. So DNM five four, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so to, to end the podcast, uh, we want to get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Uh, and so um, first things first, you just moved from New York to San Francisco. And now you lived here in San Francisco before. What was the trip like going from <laughs> New York to San Francisco? Because it, it took a, I don't know, it was about a week or so. I remember we yeah. got on the phone. Oh. You had a, you had a couple stops. Yeah. Uh, just briefly, uh, okay. tell us about uh, that experience. <laughs> no, it's an eerie feeling. You know, Buying a one-way ticket on an airplane. Yeah, I, I, um, you know, I don't think I, I've done that before. Well, and and you know, if you if you read, you know, I'm a frequent flyer. I've, I've done a million miles on one airline, and yeah. and um, 
I think this was my first one-way ticket. Yeah. But, and, and I'd been reading about, oh, that's a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't stop you. Right. No, I, we didn't get stopped. I used to get stopped more because Dan Miller is a very common name. Yeah. And, and I couldn't go until I got a trusted traveler number. <laughs> and a Twitter handle. And a Twitter D- handle. D- right. D- right. <laughs> They're both the same. Who would have thought? Um, uh you know, I was always getting pushed into another line while they cleared up that I wasn't that Dan Miller. Uh, but um, no, I, I, um, so the one way ticket had a certain finality to it. There was there was a nice cushion. We stopped in Denver where my daughter and her recent or my daughter, who was recently married yeah. um, and her husband had, have, have a place there. And we awesome. hung out where there was snow because past two years in New York. It, the winters were not winter like. There was not a lot of snow. So I got my dose of snow in Denver. <laughs> and then we got here and it is freezing. Yeah, it Just is. stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting accused of bringing New York weather to sunny California. I don't, I don't know. It's not my fault. <laughs> I did not accuse you, but yes, it has been cold here. Uh, you know, we're recording this in the February month of 2023. So it's yeah. definitely, uh, we've had a lot of snow in California. Uh, at all elevations, yeah. so it's been quite interesting. Uh, and then, um, in terms of uh, one of the questions that we ask uh, is, "What is your best day?" My- and you know, <laughs> which is, sounds funny, but if you had like the greatest day where <laughs> everything was good, you get home, you put your legs up on the couch, and you're like, "Man, that was nailed a good day. it, <laughs> nailed it, exactly!" <laughs> High five to the wife. Yeah. Uh, what would be your best yeah, day? No, this this will be ridiculous. I am a a, a big. You're the Yankees fan. I'm a Cleveland Guardians fan. And and some of the best days were seeing this low payroll, um, just young baseball team. Yeah. Um, winning. <laughs> <laughs> and that, so, that's so, the best so, thing. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's petty and everything, but but there's a reason yeah. we all love sports. <laughs> True. And, yeah, and, um, yeah the, the, we had a fun last season, and there were a lot of best days up until <laughs> the Yankees eliminated us. But um, Well, we'll we'll see how this year goes. Uh, I'm yeah. sure uh, baseball <laughs> always has its uh, great storyline. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, all right. Well, well, thank you so much uh, well, for joining you. me today. Yeah. This has been awesome. I love yeah. it being in person. We yeah. got to do this more. Yeah. And um, then to, to everybody out there, yeah. um, do, if you can, just go play around with some generative model and, and you know, uh, don't listen to what or, or take with a grain of salt the way it's being covered in both the business press and popular press. They tend to show sort of the, the bad stuff going on. Discover it for yourself. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's a way. That's definitely a great uh, advice. Um, and uh, you know, we already talked about the best way to reach you, so I think uh, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. And then um, any final uh, comments uh, uh, related? To this? No. The, um, no. This uh, just uh, this is a very exciting time. The the pace at which these technologies that I've covered for thirty plus years now. Is so fast, and yeah. and things are happening in weeks that took years. And um, carry on. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see what happens six months from now. We'll have you back and see what's going on. All right. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us on the podcast. This has uh, been another episode of Conversations That Matter. As always, if you have any questions, hit us up with the hashtag CTM Podcast, or you can email us at podcast at unifor.com. Have a great day, yep. and hope you are doing well and staying as warm and bundly uh, as possible because over here in California at this particular time, it's pretty cold. In any case, have a great day. Adios. Bye. See you. Bye. Thanks, Randy. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations That Matter. Subscribe to our podcast for more great content. And if you want to learn more about the topic we discussed, visit unifor.com today.